Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this presentation by Ryan Gibson on designing clinical AAC applications for adults with mild intellectual disabilities. The following work was carried out with my supervisors Dr Martin Locke from the University of Strathclyde and Dr Mark Milley-Boom Rand from the University of Edinburgh, along with my fellow PhD student Revity Naya. Throughout this presentation, I will be referring to the World Health Organization's definition of intellectual disability, which states that to be diagnosed with an ID, an individual must exhibit the following three symptoms. Number one, they will have a significantly reduced ability to understand new information and therefore learn and apply new skills. Number two, they will have significantly reduced ability to cope independently. Number three, these impairments will occur, occur before the age of 18 and have a lasting effect on development. For those of you who are not familiar with the domain of AAC, two types of devices may fall under this heading. Alternative devices are typically used to provide a voice for people who do not have the skills required to generate speech, with the, with the most famous example being the communication system used by Stephen Hawking. On the other hand, augmentative systems are used to enhance the verbal abilities of users who are able to generate speech but find it difficult to do so in certain situations. For example, when communicating with an unfamiliar partner. Our focus is on the development of augmentative devices for patients with mild ID, as opposed to their more severe counterparts under the hypothesis that this population is more likely to become independent advocates for their healthcare needs. But why do patients require support from AAC technologies when attending medical consultations? Well, in 2013, researchers from the University of Bristol published an inquiry into the premature deaths of people with ID, found that 43% of the 247 deaths studied occurred prematurely. In addition, 28% were directly attributable to better quality healthcare, meaning 68 patients would have survived if they'd received the level of treatment they were legally entitled to. Communication was cited as a major barrier for these patients receiving optimal care. People with ID have cognitive impairments that affect their overall knowledge of the human body, meaning they may not be able to recognise the presence of symptoms or describe them in a clear enough manner for the practitioner to form a diagnosis. The reduced receptive skills also make it difficult for them to understand complex information and impairments in abstract thinking and long-term memory can affect their ability to provide an accurate medical history. On the other hand, medical professionals tend not to be well educated and the healthcare and communication needs of patients with ID, meaning they may not be able to carry out the recommended reasonable adjustments to their consultation methods. As such, they often use complex language or communication modalities that are inappropriate to the patient's skills and rely upon caregivers to facilitate the consultation. Yet this strategy can reduce the accuracy of the information being extracted. Results of the original inquiry continue to the present day with England's Learning Disability Mortality Review Programme concluding that circa 50% of the 11,000 deaths reviewed so far failed to meet good practice standards. This therefore prompted us to carry out a scoping review of the communication aids used by adults with mild ID during primary and secondary care consultations. We found that there was a severe lack of digital aids in use despite the calls for such devices being made by medical professionals as far back as 1997, with these technologies integrating more easily into their working routines than paper-based aids. Next, we conducted exploratory work with experts to gauge their views on the feasibility of tablet applications to promote communication between patients with mild ID and GPs. The results were promising, yet the views of experts in ID may not meet all of the accessibility needs of target stakeholders. As such, a series of three user-centred design workshops were conducted with 10 adults with mild ID to determine their ideas on the use of technology during primary care consultations. The participants consisted of five males and five me females, with their age ranging from late 20s to mid 50s. All were able to provide informed consent and communicate verbally, whilst they also had the visual skills required to process imagery. The workshops consisted of four tasks designed to account for aspects important to the successful implementation of AAC devices. This included the functionality of the tablet application, the design and layout of the user interface, and images that capture the options presented, since people with ID have difficulty understanding complex concepts 
and have lower literacy skills than the general population. Tasks were designed in conjunction with experts to ensure they were accessible to participants with mild ID. Task 1 consisted of a focus group to determine the communication barriers experienced by the participants when attending consultations. Their views were captured in real time via the use of sticky notes to allow any misconceptions being made by the investigator to be challenged. Task 2 involved the critique of medical images to determine the traits that made them accessible to people with mild ID. Participants were required to formulate two image boards based on pictures that accurately described the medical condition and those that were more obscure, whose grouping similar images together to form themes. For example, those that displayed the wrong facial expression were placed in a similar section of an ineffective image board. All images were accompanied by a short textual description to ensure that the participant was aware of what was being depicted. Task 3 involved the development of a paper prototype using pre-developed artefacts such as buttons as well as those envisioned by the user. In Task 4, participants were required to evaluate a high fidelity prototype application which was developed using the requirements extracted from the aforementioned experts. This enabled additional requirements to be captured that were not originally identified during Task 3 without biasing the views of the participants. Task 4 was conducted using a post-task walkthrough protocol. Focus groups and post-task walkthroughs were analysed via framework analysis. All tasks were recorded with participant consent and transcribed verbatim. I familiarised myself with the data whilst developing an initial thematic framework, which was then reviewed by brevity prior to a consensus being reached. For the paper prototypes, each distinct feature was tagged and transferred to a table, which was then sorted via the frequency column. This ensured developers were aware of the features prioritised by people with mild ID. No further analysis was required on the image boards since the participants themselves grouped pictures together into similar themes. Five primary barriers were discussed by the participants, first of which was gaining access to healthcare services. Many of the participants were consistently waiting three to four weeks to gain access to a GP, which had the potential to heighten their conditions as well as induce an unnecessary sense of worry. There was also a variance in operating procedures used to disseminate information to patients. One participant received a diabetes diagnosis over the phone, which was inappropriate to their own needs and resulted in them ignoring their condition for several years. He indicated that a face-to-face -face appointment would have enabled him to have his concerns addressed on the day of his diagnosis, thus leading to a better understanding of how to manage diabetes. Finally, some patients indicated that they were unaware of most medical symptoms and therefore relied upon family members to recognise that they were unwell. The second sub-theme centred on the practising GP. Participants felt that the bulk of GPs were unable to adjust their consultation methods to cater to their own needs. As such, all preferred to interact with a single professional whom they had built a relationship with over time. These GPs were unaware of the communication preferences of the participants and had a greater understanding of their medical histories, most of which were complex in com comparison to the general population. The amount of time afforded to the consultation was also recognised as a prominent barrier. 60% of the participants failed to adequ adequately prepare for medical appointments which affected their ability to communicate about their needs. In addition, time restrictions meant that GPs were unable to explore all potential causes of a particular condition, instead prioritised treating the superficial symptoms, for example by issuing painkillers. When prompted on implementation of double appointments, just one of the participants indicated they were aware of the right to do so. Most of the participants attended medical appointments with a caregiver or family member, the main role of the caregiver was to act as an intermediary between the patient and GP whilst explaining important information to the patient after the consultation. Nonetheless, some participants reported that family members in particular could become over-involved in the consultation process, thus overshadowing the views of the patient. Some participants were unable to receive the support received from paid caregivers due to funding cuts. Throughout the image board task, the participants reviewed three sets of images, realistic photographs, detailed coloured drawings and simplistic black and white symbols. Five main themes emerged that affected the clarity of the images reviewed. 
First time each depicts an individual who is in pain while she urinating, yet some of the participants felt that the facial expressions displayed indicated happiness. When prompted on how to improve the clarity of this image, some felt it would be more appropriate to include a person who is crying, thus indicating more extreme emotions may be preferred by people with ID. Participants also complained about the position of the individual's head, since the associated looking up with being in pain as opposed to looking to the side. This suggests that the body language may also be an important aspect in the medical images employed. Colour was used to indicate the area and intensity of pain. For example, in the second image, a red circle is used to show an individual experiencing pain in his, in his chest. Participants suggested that red and orange should be used for more intense pains, whereas green and blue could indicate numbness. All preferred the more realistic images and colour drawings in comparison to the black and white symbols as they offered greater detail. For example, in the bottom image, the participants were unsure as to whether the character's eyes were open or not. The features tagged within the paper prototypes were grouped under four main themes, pre-questionnaire, questionnaire, post-questionnaire post and modalities. Prior to the appointment, participants believed that the application could assist them in remembering the data details of current appointments problem that may occur due to short-term memory impairments. Time, location and practice in GP were considered to be the most important aspects. Images should be presented alongside key information to supplement the patient's understanding of what is being presented. The option to play back text should also be incorporated to cater to users who are illiterate or semi-literate. The button in the top left-hand side of the screen facilitates the audio requirements of users by highlighting and reading out all subsections included on the screen, for example the title of the page and then each of the options below. In addition to remembering appointments, the participants involved in workshop 3 had difficulties contacting and accessing primary care practices. As such, the request of the app displays the contact details of local GPs as well as other healthcare services in case they are better suited to their needs. To assist them in attending their appointments, the participants requested access to public transport timetables, thus breaking their reliance on caregivers or family members to facilitate such a process. The participants felt that providing symptoms in advance of the consultation could help to improve communication. This should be achieved via a medical questionnaire that responds to the individual healthcare needs of the user. First, the primary body part or condition causing them distress should be identified prior to additional symptoms that can help the professional to formulate a diagnosis. A maximum of six symptoms should be displayed at any one time to ease the cognitive load placed on the user, with the ability to select more than one option at a time being available if relevant. As with prior screens, multiple modalities including text, speech and imagery are used to increase the user's understanding of the symptoms displayed. All participants also understood the concept of left equals back and right equals forward in the questionnaire. The prototype involved in the post-task walkthroughs essentially matched the functionality identified during the paper prototyping process. It includes a medical questionnaire that aims to first identify the primary condition causing the patient dis distress prior to extracting further symptoms. A summary of the selected options is then presented at the end for use as a referent during the consultation. Even with the functionality being similar to the generated paper prototypes, some of the users were initially unable to grasp the questionnaire's structure. It was not until the lead investigator intervened that they were able to progress through the questions. As such, the participants indicated that an initial tutorial may be required prior to the first time users interacting with the application. There is also some scope for customization to ensure the application meets the accessibility needs of users. This mainly centered on the background color of the application to suit specific eye conditions, align with difficulties such as dyslexia and the dialect used to play by text. Opportunities for future work include exploring the needs of people with ID from rural communities since nine of the ten participants lived in the cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Establishing the requirements of medical professionals and caregivers to ensure their needs are met by the application and its design is feasible within current practice. And finally, performing an evaluation within the clinical domain to identify the true benefits of the aid. I leave you there with the key lessons learned throughout the paper and if you have any questions you can follow them on to the contact details below. Thanks for listening.